Hello, dear students of ancient religion, and welcome to hell. Hades, the underworld in funerary practices. Glad you could make it. And after our last lecture of deviant cults and philosophical evasions of traditional Greek religious conceptions, we return with a vengeance to traditional ancient Greek religion. There was little change in the attitude from the Bronze Age, as documented by Homer in the 800s BCE, until the fall of paganism in the 4th and 5th centuries CE, a period of more than a thousand years. And what we say here about the Greeks will hold true more or less for ancient Romans and other Indo-European peoples as well. We might call attitudes toward the dead the beating, even if dark, heart of paganism. Let us return briefly to days with no written records, the Mycenaean Bronze Age. Heinrich Schliemann, a German businessman who made part of his fortune in the United States, was a self-funded archaeologist who grew up believing in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey as literal history. This was at a time when scholars considered the works pure myth and were questioning the very existence of an author named Homer. Schliemann, however, using these literary works as his guide, famously discovered grave goods at Mycenae in Greece, as well as, of course, treasures at Hisarlik in Turkey, the ancient site of Troy. We begin with Mycenae because these graves reveal bodies that were buried whole. They were put in the ground, or humus, as it's called in Latin, which means that the bereaved survivors practiced inhumation. We'll return to inhumation when we take up cremation, or the practice of burning corpses. But let's linger at the graves of Mycenae from around 1500 BCE. The bodies were completely clothed adorned with gold jewelry. The men were buried with their weapons, as well as with the other equipment they had used in life. The women, too, were clothed, decked with jewelry and equipped with household items, including dishes, cutlery, the images of gods. Such items are often on display in museums, and they dazzle. Golden drinking cups, signet rings, the famous so-called Mask of Agamemnon, small boxes worked in gold and covered with images, golden diadems. These graves displayed wealth in death to the living before the treasures disappeared under the earth for thousands of years. Did these grave goods demonstrate belief in life after death? Perhaps, if comparative evidence from Egypt is any indication, Indeed, why carry such things into the grave if they were not going to be of some use? There was, of course, some use in this as a statement for the living. Hey, our family is so rich, we can afford to throw this all away. And later, literary evidence sketches for us a conception of how ancient Greeks conceived of life after death. Our earliest literary witnesses offer glum views of a shadowy existence. In the 11th book of the Odyssey, Odysseus visits Hades, where, according to the instructions he received, he pours blood into a pit. Odysseus describes the souls who appear. Then, out of Erebus, the souls of the dead gathered, the ghosts of brides and youths and worn-out old men, and soft young girls with hearts new to sorrow. And many men, wounded with bronze spears, killed in battle, bearing blood-stained arms, they drifted up to the pit from all sides with an eerie cry, and pale fear seized me. From this grim description, we gather that the dead retain an image of who they most recently were before they died. And after Odysseus recovers from his initial shock, he begins to converse with the spirits and even expresses admiration for how well Achilles seems to be doing in death, remarking, No man, Achilles, has ever been as blessed as you are, or ever will be. While you were alive, the army honored you like a god, and now you are here. You rule the dead with might. You should not lament your death at all, Achilles. Achilles' response, however, confirms that Odysseus' first impression was closer to the mark. Don't try to sell me on death, Odysseus. I'd rather be a hired hand back up on earth. 
slaving away for some poor dirt farmer than lord it over all these withered dead. We may compare the gloom and pale spirits of Homer's Hades, where the dead mingle in rather undifferentiated crowds, to earlier Mesopotamian descriptions. In a work entitled The Descent of Ishtar, a goddess of sexual love who corresponds to Greek Aphrodite, we read, The dark house, the house which none leave who have entered it, the road from which there is no way back, the house where the entrance are bereft of light, where dust is their fare and clay their food, where they see no light residing in darkness, where they are clothed like birds with wings for garments, and where over the door and bolt is spread dust. On the gloom of the underworld, Bronze Age Greeks and ancient Mesopotamians agree. This conception would change with time. But before we visit later versions of hell, let's return to the living and look at how the bereaved dealt with the dead. Death, of course, presents problems for the living. Although we have testimony about the fate of the dead surviving as souls in some shadowy afterlife, it is the living who deal with the absence of the deceased as well as with the lifeless body that the deceased has left behind. Ancient peoples also believed that the ceremonies they performed for the corpse materially benefited the still sentient spirit that had been separated from his or her body. It was thus a universal and solemn religious duty for ancient Greeks to bury the dead. Relatives had to bury their kindred. Children had to bury their parents. The Athenian lawgiver Solon legislated that even children who had been neglected and abused by their parents and thus released from parental authority by the state had to bury their parents. It was both a legal and a religious duty. Even Plato's philosophical ideal state required this pious duty of its citizens. And the duty went beyond mere relatives. If one encountered an unburied corpse, one was supposed to throw some dirt on it, because one of the worst possible fates was to have one's body left unburied as plunder for dogs or a feast for birds. Elpiner, one of Odysseus's men, had been left behind unburied when Odysseus journeyed to the underworld. Odysseus explains, the ghost of Elpiner came first to the pit of blood. His body still lay in Circe's hall, unmourned, unburied, since we'd been hard pressed. Odysseus admits that they had left Elpiner behind, unburied. Elpiner then confronts Odysseus and names all the family members most dear to Odysseus. Elpiner says, and I quote, Now I beg you, by those we left behind, by your wife and the father who reared you, and by Telemachus, your only son, whom you left alone in your halls, when you put the gloom of Hades behind you, do not leave me unburied, unmourned. When you sail for home, or I might become a cause of the gods' anger against you, burn me with my armor such as I have. Heat me a mound on the gray sea's shore in memory of a man whose luck ran out. Elpiner succinctly outlines what is required. He must be buried, he must be mourned, and he must be burned with his armor. Failure to do this will anger the gods. And yes, my astute ones, thank you for paying attention. There's a bit of a contradiction here. Elpiner wants to be both buried and burned. So which is it? Inhumation or cremation? It was both, of course. By the 800s BCE, when Homer was writing, and generally thereafter, the body was burned on a pyre, after which the bones were collected, placed in an urn, and then buried. We may thus talk of burial, even when speaking of bodies that were first cremated. That's the basic overview, but more was involved than just this. After the spirit has departed from the body, care of the corpse begins. One must close the eyes, bathe the body, anoint the body with oil, place the body on a resting bed with its feet turned toward the door. After the invention of money, an obol for the ferryman Charon was placed in the mouth. The corpse is then decked out in fine clothes and perfumes. According to the 2nd century CE rhetorician Lucian, 
Next come cries of distress, wailing of women, tears on all sides, beaten breasts, torn hair, bloody cheeks, perhaps too clothing is rent and dust sprinkled on the head, and they roll on the ground repeatedly and dash their heads against the floor. Lucian describes the funeral of a young man who died before his parents. He continues, informing us that then his father comes forward from among the family and throws himself upon him. In a plaintive tone, he will say, Dearest child, you are gone from me, dead, reft away before your time, leaving me behind all alone. Woe unto me before marrying, before having children. We see a more spectacular version of this when Achilles mourns for his comrade, friend, and as some argue, lover, Patroclus in the Iliad. Homer tells us that the Greeks mourned Patroclus the whole night through. Achilles began the incessant lamentation, laying his manslaying hands on Patroclus' chest and groaning over and over like a bearded lion. Achilles' slave woman, Briseis, reacts similarly. Briseis stood there like golden Aphrodite, but when she saw Patroclus's mangled body, she threw herself upon him and wailed in a high, piercing voice, and with her nails she tore her breast and soft neck and lovely face. In short, open lamentation and expressions of grief were customary for both men and women, and remained so from the 800s BCE until Lucian's time in the second century CE and beyond. Also, from Homer's time until late antiquity, a funeral pyre would be erected. Friends carried the corpse on a bier to the pyre, where they burned the body. Depending on the gender and status of the deceased, weapons or other gear were thrown into the flames. Sacrificial animals, and sometimes human beings too, were burned with the body. At Patroclus's funeral, Homer tells us that in addition to a huge pile of wood, they placed the bodies of slaughtered sheep and oxen on the pyre, as well as amphoras of honey and oil. And with heavy groans, quickly cast on the pyre four high-necked horses, nine dogs once fed under the prince's table. Achilles cut the throats of two and cast them on, and twelve Trojans also, sons from good families, slashing them with bronze in a vengeful spirit. Then he kindled the fire and let its iron will rage. This was an expensive funeral, and it included twelve fine young victims from an enemy city's best families, a human sacrifice. But this was just in the Iliad, you protest. Later Greeks were too civilized for that. True. In historical times, we do not read about human sacrifice at funeral pyres. On the other hand, funeral ceremonies for ruling class Romans frequently included displays of gladiatorial combats with fights to the death. Human sacrifice or mere entertainment? We will postpone this question and return to the funeral pyres of the Greeks. The funeral pyre is lit and people continue to mourn. And Achilles wailed for his friend as he burned his bones, moving slowly about the pyre, groaning heavily. After the fires have died down, wine is poured on the embers. The bones are gathered and doused with more wine before they are placed in an urn. Again, Achilles gives instructions to his Greek comrades. First, quench the funeral fire with wine, wherever it burned. Then gather the bones of Patroclus, son of Menedius. Pick them out carefully. They are easily recognized, for he lay in the middle, while the others burned off to the sides, men and horses jumbled. The urn is put in a box and buried in a small mound or tumbos, from which word we derive the word tomb. The grave is then marked. Elpiner had asked Odysseus for an oar to mark his grave. After the Greeks became literate, they erected tombstones with inscriptions that provide additional insights into religious attitudes toward death. We will return to this topic. Depending on the magnificence of the funeral, it might also include choruses, dances, and games that went on for a number of days. The conclusion of ceremonies was a meal. In more historical times, especially in democratic Athens, Funeral ceremonies were limited by law 
The Athenian lawgiver Solon, we are told, shifted the beginning of ceremonies from dusk to dawn, and mourning was limited to 11 days. To deny such ceremonies, even to an enemy, was a religious crime. Sophocles' tragedy Antigone can only be fully understood in the context of this deeply felt religious obligation. In this tragedy, Antigone suffers death rather than allow her brother to be denied a proper funeral ceremony. There is also the curious, to us, case of Athenian naval commanders who were executed after a major naval victory. Their crime? According to Socrates in Plato's Apology, when a storm arose after the victory, the generals failed to collect the bodies of those who had been slain. There were exceptions. Traitors and criminals could be denied burial, but this was a severe punishment indeed, as the consequences could be dangerous for the living. The gods could be offended and become angry, of course, but more dangerously, the soul, whose body has been left unburied, is condemned to wander without rest. This ghost becomes unhappy and potentially malevolent. The only comfort for the dead is a proper burial, and the fear of not being buried may well have been greater than the fear of death, as death is inevitable. But a burial is not something that one can arrange on one's own after one has died. The dead must rely on the living. Some see in the cult of the dead the origins of ancient religion, and it makes a certain intuitive sense. If you have ever had a vivid dream of someone who has died, I can certainly recall my own confusion after first waking, whether or not the person I'd seen in my dreams was really dead. I also once attended a wake for a young woman who had died in childbirth. A sister leaned over the coffin and begged her sister to visit her in her dreams. And by all accounts, ancient people paid much closer attention to their dreams than do sleep-deprived moderns. Such dreams could well suggest that the dead weren't really gone, but retained a ghostly existence. And this is what inscriptions on gravestones seem to indicate. Ancient Greeks set up ins inscriptions to their deceased relatives with the phrase Theois Chthoniois, which means literally, for the gods of the earth. Ancient Romans used a similar phrase in Latin, dis manibus, for the deceased spirits. And we have evidence in the Rig Veda that ancient Indians similarly reverenced their departed, whose spirits were conceived of as returning to their ancestors. Once dead, all spirits become members of the deceased family, known collectively as ancestral spirits. And worship of ancestral spirits, as well as tending to their graves, was a duty of the male head of household, and was something other members of the household participated in too. One's ancestors did more than simply disappear into the ground. They remained part of the family. At the grave site were altars where the dead, like the gods, could continue to receive offerings, libations, drink offerings, as well as solid foods. Peaceful relations were maintained with the properly honored dead by regular care for the graves. Such family spirits could even become tutelary deities or guardian spirits for their family. And when such departed spirits belonged to men or women who had accomplished more than most mortals, they could be worshipped beyond their families as heroes. And heroes sometimes become gods in their own right. Heracles even joined the Olympians. Following such a progression, one can understand the logic of those who argue that cult and care for the dead represent the first source of ancient religious practices, and thus the gods. But let us quickly return from the gods who belonged to everyone to the departed spirits who belonged to individual families. As you will recall from our discussion of family worship, each family had its own religious practices, household gods and cult. Maintaining relations with ancestral spirits, which is to say the spirits of deceased relatives, played a crucial role in that family worship. The institution of the family was, in many aspects, much more powerful in the ancient world than it is today. 
Much of the history of European and other Western societies has been the history of the state gradually usurping powers that were earlier located within the family and the clan or extended family. The religion of the family, including ancestors, personal gods, and private rights, provided greater justifications for the sanctity of one's home and private life than do our own intellectual notions of private property and the rights extended to us by the state through the Constitution and its laws. Just as the state has arrogated legal authority over all individuals in a family, including children, that trump the rights of parents, so too the victory of the Christian Church represented an enormous victory for communal religious association over the family's rights. The authority of the church, backed by the power of the state, would eventually dictate the end of private religion and assert its sole right to establish religious doctrine and proper forms of worship. And later Roman law, taking its cue, specifically prohibits all forms of private family religion. We will return to this topic. For the moment, we explore the implications of ongoing care for the dead and a general reverence for one's ancestors, that is, the collective spirits of an extended family going back generation upon generation. This reverence for deceased ancestors was a powerful force for conservative values opposed to innovation. The true family is not just the extended family on this earth, but a communion of the living and the dead. Just as the gods join human beings for a communal meal after sacrifice, the dead continue to share in the meals offered by family members at their graves and altars. If then we imagine a world where our ancestors are not truly gone but remain watchful, and we know that we too will dwell among them after our own brief sojourn in the light of this world, we will work to maintain their goodwill and also ensure that our own family bestows upon us those same ceremonies that will ensure continuity. This logic promotes constant vigilance to ensure that rites and ceremonies remain unchanged and unaltered, and helps explain the impressive continuity of attitudes and procedures that span some thousand years. We may also observe, from our modern legal perspective, that to ensure continuity, the head of household, the father, required a son of his own blood. The spark of life, as it were, had to be handed down in a continuous family chain. This religious belief returns us to the perceived religious necessity of, impo of imposing and securing the chastity of the wife. Family spirits were offended when ceremonies were performed by the illegitimate offspring of adulterous wives. Religion reinforces social and legal relations at every turn. Patriarchy runs deep, my friends, in ancient religion as in ancient law. As always, these general principles may be taken with a grain of salt. Inscriptions on Greek tombstones display a wide variety of attitudes. We find, of course, inscriptions that confirm the general outlines of what we have just discussed, such as this one for deceased son. No longer does your mother take you in her hands, Philoxenus, and cast them lingeringly about your lovely neck. Nor do you go to the famous city with the young men or rejoice in the shaded hall of the gymnasium. Your father, Countess, brought your strong bones here and buried them when he touched the flesh with the fire that consumes everything. We observe grief for a lost child as well as a reference to the funeral pyre. In another inscription from the second century CE, we may observe testimony that the conception of the dead as collective spirits remains current. I quote the epigram, your soul has flown from the bones to the other spirits and now you dwell in the plane of the blessed ones. In, in an inscription from the island of Rhodes, we find that the deceased had most likely been initiated into the mysteries of Demeter, and for this reason, hoped for a better life in Hades, we read, a secretary. This man taught for 50 years, 
and two more in addition. Now the plane of the pious holds him, for Pluto and Cori have given him a place to dwell. Hermes and Hecate, the torchbearer, have made him beloved of all and supervisor of the mysteries because of his faithfulness. We may contrast this demonstration of pious belief, however, with an inscription that specifically requests that the living not perform the rites customary for the dead on his behalf. Do not bring me anything to drink. When I was alive, I drank. Do not bring me anything to eat. I have enough. All is nonsense. If for the sake of remembrance of the life I lived with you, you bring saffron or frankincense as a gift, friends. You give these things appropriately to those who have received me. These things belong to the gods below. The dead have nothing to do with the living. Another inscription expresses a similar attitude more pithily. There is nothing more, nothing remains to the dead, than to afflict the mind of the passerby. There is nothing else. What can I say? We can generalize about ancient society, but skeptic individuals crop up in every age, and some had a sense of humor. Do not pass by, my epitaph wayfarer, but stand, listen, and when you have heard, go on your way. There is no boat in Hades, no ferryman Karen, no Iacus, keeper of the keys, no dog Cerberus. All of us who have died and gone below are bones and nothing else. I have spoken to you truthfully. Go away, traveler, lest I appear to you, though dead, to be an idle talker. Unlike the mere names that generally appear on stones today, these epitaphs make an effort to speak to us. And because they were actually carved in antiquity, they speak to us more immediately and directly than any other genre. We have looked at pious as well as irreverent epitaphs. Death was, I imagine, as sad in antiquity, especially as life frequently ended more abruptly and sooner than it does for us, as it did, for example, for this young woman. Nicandrus was my father, Paros my country, my name is Socrates. When I died, Parmenian, my husband, buried me, granting me this gift, that it be a memory of a seemly life, and that it be at hand even to the people of the future. The fury of childbirth, which cannot be guarded against, destroyed my pleasant life through a hemorrhage. By my pains, I could not bring the child into the light, but he lives among the dead in my womb. Alas, as mortals, we are all destined to die. An ancient religion provided a way to structure the removal of the dead, explain what happened to the spirit of the deceased, and use the ceremonies that cared for departed souls to structure family and social life. Some minds rebelled against traditional conceptions, but the beliefs, rites, and ceremonies of the ancient Greeks proved remarkably consistent century after century. A new religion would eventually change this, but that is not where we go in our next lecture. Instead, we go back in time to ancient Egypt, where ideas about the fate of the soul were developed in far greater detail than among the Greeks. And the influence of Egyptian conceptions on later Greek, Roman, and Christian beliefs was extensive. But this awaits you in the next lecture. Until then, dear students of ancient religion and cult practices, may your studies as well as your nights and days be auspicious.